I'm Aria Schwartz, along with my co-host, Rachel Galligan, and welcome to the Windsider Show, where it's all about the W. Today, we're talking about the WNBA Semifinals Game 3 Reactions. If you like our show, please consider joining our Patreon community. For less than a cup of coffee a month, you can directly show support for the hard work we do covering the W. The Aces of Las Vegas held on for one more day, but the LA Sparks, not so much as they got swept out of the Long Beach uh, Arena or whatever the hell that place was called. <laughs> Rachel, <laughs> Rachel, um, quite quite the, the Sunday evening slot of games. Your thoughts? Oof. The drama, the drama was almost too much to bear. <laughs> I'm glad. Oh, sh- we lo- we love that drama. Oof! I- I'm glad I had a night's sleep before we decided to jump on here to record because I think we needed to like level out a little bit, and I'll be the first one to admit that. <laughs> but uh, no, it was uh, it was definitely an interesting night. That could definitely be an understatement of the year. Uh, something we do want to throw out there: we did plan on doing an episode uh, before the games where we would have predicted an accurate depiction of what happened. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, due to, uh, to some technical difficulties uh, and horrible internet in uh, Baltimore, we were unable to do that. So our apologies to our fans and to the main girl, <laughs> Jasmine. Um, but I know she's part of the REA army. So Rachel, you better zip it. Uh, but let's talk, let's talk real quick about LA versus Connecticut. The Connecticut sun just strutted, did the William strut into the Long Beach Arena and just put a shellacking on the L.A. Sparks, ending their season in, quite frankly, an embarrassing fashion for L.A. I mean, let's let's not pull any punches because, well, this is professional sports, so why the hell would we? It was embarrassing to get blown out and just destroyed. They There was not an L- – like, our, Rachel, going into this series – we thought this would be a series. This was a tough one to call, and Connecticut made it clear this yeah, was not I, I, a tough one to call. I was one, one of the call. first ones to sit here at our crew to say, man, I, I really felt like this was going to go to five um, and would be probably the most competitive series out of the two. Um, so I'm, I'm very much in shock in some ways, just, just how much L.A. rolled over in, in my mind um, these last three games. But, you know, when I step back and really think about Connecticut and – you know, this is a team that we've questioned their ability to win come playoff time. Um, and especially how are they going to perform in a five game series? But that's something we haven't seen. And my God, they, they, they were tremendous. I mean, I think we all know or, you know, several people <laughs> had to have known how talented this team is and that they had, you know, the right squad this year to be able to to do what they did, but it hadn't been seen before. Um, and we're just really seeing this roster, uh, this this coaching staff, everything that they've built these last few years come to fruition here and the dominance that they've shown. You know, you, you, know, you, 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 you have some really tough losses um, in those single round elimination games the last couple of years and, and learning from that and growing from that and, and everything that this team has gone through together, um, I guess you know, I shouldn't be surprised, <laughs> you know, to, to see the sun playing the way they're playing. And I, I've always been extremely vocal on how much, um, how high I am on Kurt Miller, um, and his, his basketball IQ and his knowledge. And that, that date, that dates back to, you know, competing against him as a collegiate coach and just really understanding, um, the way his mind works in a lot of ways. Um, I, I just, I really have always respected him and his coaching ability. So, the fact that he's put this this roster together, and, and and right now I think the added cherry on top, if you will, if you will, is this is a team with a chip on their shoulder. You know, we keep talking about the role player comment and um, some of the things that have been said these last, you know, this last week and a half or so has really fired this team up. And you've got a player in Courtney Williams who, you know, is 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 probably an all-time high in terms of her popularity within the league but for, for those of us who really cover it like we're not surprised with what Courtney Williams is doing she's she's a very talented player she's in my mind an all-star and and she's someone that has the ability to go off any given night she called it before this series she's like I'm a bucket <laughs> you know and, and and I love the swag I love the attitude that she's bringing I love everything that's happened with her dad right now mm-hmm. and um, then you talk about Jasmine Thomas uh, you know she was phenomenal 
on Sunday night, you know, finishing with 29 points, 11 for 14 from the field. And so the whole role player comment and, and everything this team, the momentum they have behind them, you know, when you get a team that that is that has has great chemistry, um, has a great IQ, um, they're coached extremely well, and you add a chip on their shoulder, um, it, they're as dangerous as ever. And I mean, they just they just completely steamrolled LA. Um, and I, I was a little bit fired up last night. <laughs> I tried, to, I tried to keep it as, uh, as PG, um, as I could, <laughs> but you know, it, it's, I'm not trying to take anything away from, from the LA Sparks season, if you will, but I agree with you, this entire series, um, was an embarrassment for them. Uh, I'm just going to play this audio clip from the post game presser. Cause I think it's important. I mean, I feel like we was just doing what we do. You know, it's not really a magic potion to it. It's just kind of like, you know, I walk up to Bob and I say, yo, you a dog. So do what you do. And I walk up to JJ and I say, hey, baby, nobody can guard you. And I walk up to 40 and I say, you're the best shooter in the league. And then I walk up to AT and I say, yo, you're the toughest person in the league right now. Nobody can hold you. And then, you know, I'm a bucket. So I tell myself, yo, you on the bug. And that's it. That 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 encompasses it. They they have that mentality. They have that swagger, and they have the camaraderie. They the fire is on their ass right now, and they are moving quick. And and not even you know as I hate when I say this, but I feel like they are already on to the next series. They, this whole series, it was like, oh yeah, this is a way for us to get our shots down and get some practice shots up before we move on to the finals. I mean that that was kind of the mindset. Is that is that an overreach? No, no, I don't think so. I, I just think they, they're, this is a team that knows how to win come playoff time. You know, they, they've been through it. And honestly, Derek Fisher spoke on it in his press conference last night in terms of understanding a team knowing how to win come playoff time. Um, this, you can't look at playoffs the same way you look at a regular, regular season. Um, and, and it's a completely different ball game. There's so much added pressure and, and it comes down to um, players being able to step up in key moments. And that's the part that's confusing with LA right now is because you do have veteran players on the floor who have stepped up come playoff time in the past. Um, but I think the difference right now is you have a franchise in Connecticut that has built from the ground up for this moment. They've been prepared for it. And when you get, when you get it come playoff time, you know, it, it comes down to coaching and it comes down to your coach's ability to prepare your team for this moment. Now, these players are prepared, you know, because they've been through that process of losing and understanding what that feels like and having to stomach that for an entire season before you get that shot again. Uh, but but Kurt Miller is poised for this moment to get his team prepared, to get his team playing at their peak come playoff time. Derek Fisher is not. And that's not necessarily a huge knock on him. How could he possibly be prepared? You know, he coached the Knicks for a short period of time. There was nothing there to, that would have prepared him for this. This is his first season coaching women in general. How on earth was he going to be prepared come playoff time? I mean, at the end of the day, Kurt Miller coached circles around Derek Fisher. It is what it is. I'm not trying to take away what Derek Fisher was able to do this season, the move they made, all that sort of stuff. They, they, they won 22 games in the regular season. But the Connecticut Sun have had their eye on a finals appearance all year. They've worked for it for multiple years now. Um, and I, I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think you ever want to think, Oh, you know, they're, if, if their mind was already on the finals, that would have shown up in their play that they've just been so locked in, you know, from, from yeah, I, I didn't mean in the sense of like, Oh, blah, 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 blah. I mean, in the sense of like, they are so locked in that it's like, for- this is, this is just like something that we have to step over to get to where our fine, where our story ends for the season and where our story ends is a a championship. I mean, at least the finals. Um, Let's flip it over. I mean, the hot topic coming out of this game on the LA side, and and I do want to preface this with kind of reiterating what you, which you brought in there, which was a, you're talking about Derek Fisher. Now there's a lot of flack when he came in, he doesn't have history. He wasn't a great coach in the NBA. What's he going to do in the W this, this, and that all that aside, like give the man credit. The, The man coached the team. Well, dealt with a crap load of injuries, dealt with not having Vidiva for 18 games or something, not having the best defender in the league, in the game, possibly ever, Elena Beard for 17, 18 games, Candace Parker misses half a season. I mean, there's a, a laundry list of excuses you could give, but the fact of the matter is going into the playoffs, this LA team was fully healthy. 
This LA team was one of the, if not the scariest teams in the league going into the playoffs, and they just got their butt kicked. I mean, th- there's no other way to put it. And, the, you know, a big topic that needs to be brought up is the questions of the stars. I mean, A, with like 6.45 left, Derek Fisher pulls all the stars. Uh, Candace Parker plays a total 11 minutes in the game. And I'm going to let you go off on this because because you've played, you've coached, you definitely supersede any thoughts that I can have on this topic. But my initial thought is just how do you give – one of the greatest players ever to touch the basketball. I'm not talking men or women. I'm talking about ever to touch the basketball. Candace Parker, she can do it all. How do you only give her 11 minutes? How does a player get in a rhythm in 11 minutes? I know we recently had uh, John Quill Jones on our podcast, shameless plug, go check it out. Uh, And one of the things I spoke to her about is like, what are things that you can do to get going in the game? And she said, get an early inside bucket or get a bucket inside with the defender on me really gets me jazzed up, really gets me going. You need to know those things as a coach and say, okay, let me draw up a play to get Candace Parker going. I mean, she dropped what, like 20 some in game one and then disappeared for game two. Fine. But like you saw that so recently, you know, she has it in her like, well, what the hell's going on here? Yeah, and I mean, I'm just as a, I'm just at a loss as much as everybody else is. You know, we saw vintage Candace Parker, like the Candace Parker in Game One, 24 points. You know, 10 for 14 from the field, played 31 minutes. You know, that it was like it got everybody really excited for the potential of what, you know, she was about to do in this series. And then to see Game Two kind of happen the way it did, where she really. Um, was a non-factor. You know, she really blended in as, I guess, quote unquote, a role player, if you will. But, you know, only three shots for you know three points on the game in 26 minutes. It was, you know, I, the commentators at the time were really talking about, you know, was she tired, you know, some injuries, tweaked her ankle, different things like that, which of course, you know, there there could be some of that. I, I hate to say it, but guys, she's at the tail end of her career. We we know that. But at the same time, it was, it, game two was a little bit, shocking. Um, and I, I, there's just so much to talk about. So forgive me if I'm all over the place here a little bit, but you know, for a player like that, um, and, and, and a team like this, that's so star studded, um, and, and really have become accustomed to being in this environment, um, through the course of their careers, I really did feel like LA coming into this series was playing at their best. So it, for it to do a complete 180 and to lay an egg the way they did was, um, very, very shocking. Um, and I think you, you know, you have to then take it for the coaching and you have to look at the coaching and try to understand why wasn't this team ready to go come playoff time. Um, and, and, and like for to the 11 minutes last night for Candace Parker, I don't have an answer for that. Um, you know, I don't have an answer as to why the starters were pulled with six and a half minutes to go in the game. And you just basically are waving the red flag. I can't relate to that as a coach or as a competitor. That's not something that I could have ever done in that moment. Um, I feel like, you know, maybe this team in some capacity, once they got to playoff time or once they lost that first game, maybe became a little bit disinterested or some players were just um, maybe their, their, their minds were elsewhere. Um, and, and I just don't think it's fair to sit here and say that was just Candace Parker. And I don't, I'm not even saying that's the case. But what I think was happening last night with Derek Fisher, mm-hmm. he's trying to prove a point. Um he's trying to make a point. He's trying to make an example out of a situation where maybe he felt Parker was not engaged, not locked in, you know, and maybe if if that's how he feels, a coach 100% has that right to make a point and to make that decision. My issue with that is you don't do it in an elimination game with a top five, top five player of all time. That's the part that's confusing. You have to live and die with Candace Parker on the floor. You know, you, you make your point, you pull her out. Hey, are you ready to go or not? Like what's going on? I, you shouldn't be having these conversations in, in an, in an elimination game in the playoffs. And and the announcers last night did a tremendous job. You know, they, they did that wired up where they went into the huddle and Fisher's talking about cutting hard and working hard and, you know, play harder. Like those aren't the things that you are supposed to be talking to your team about at this point in season. That's just not what you're talking about. You know, this is a team that was not prepared come playoff time. And, and it wasn't just Candace Parker for whatever reason it might have been. And that's the issue. Like, if you want to prove a point, well, let's talk about Chelsea Gray or let's talk about Raquana Williams, who, you know, Chelsea Gray, what 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 she scored? 24 points the entire three-game series? 24 
That, that would be nice. 21 points in three games. Courtney Williams outscored her. Uh, Courtney Williams herself outscored Raquana and Chelsea Gray, and you can drop any game that you want from from uh, from her game. Like, we're talking about Raquana and Chelsea Gray's three games up against Courtney Williams' two games, and we got a clear-cut winner. And that's embarrassing. That's not okay. You're not going to win a championship. We went into the series saying Chelsea Gray and Raquana Williams are going to have to shoot well. And to be quite frank, like not to throw shade at Jasmine Thomas, who I think is an amazing player, I did not have the confidence in her for three games to shut down the guards on LA. And she did. And, and Kurt Miller talked about it in the press game conference or the post game conference saying, hey, like, you know, many people didn't think she was going to do it. She's a two time uh, all defense, you know, first team all defense, blah, blah, blah. She needs to be getting respect as a shutdown defender. And I mean, heck, she can score yeah. too. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, for LA, this entire series, the only player that showed up ready to go was Neko Gumke. You know, from this. Which I, I do want to ask you, like, what you've been on a team, you've you've gone through ups and downs. Uh, if I if my stats are correct, you never won a national <laughs> championship. Um, but <laughs> um, but like, what what goes through your mind as a player when you like? I'm not going to say that other people like, all right, the big criticism of Candace Park that everyone was saying was she wasn't showing the effort. She wasn't there, blah, blah, blah. But I will rebut that and say, I watched the game. I wasn't there. I'm based in DC. Couldn't get it, make it out to LA for it. But watching the game, I didn't see that. I didn't see her, you know, lack it. I saw typical Candace Parker out there. Um, and, you know, she has that ability where she could have gone off in the, in the third quarter for 15, 20 points, but what does it do when – so, I'm, again, I'm not saying that the players gave up on this game, but, like, what does that do to NECA, you know, going to battle, putting her body on the line endlessly? I mean, heck, even Shanae going into a series up against your former team did not seem to have that same fight as her sister. What does that do to you and your mentality as far as, like, you are the cornerstone of this team besides Candace Parker? I mean, I just feel like that's – that's the the nature of NECA. You know, that's who she is as a competitor. I think she's she's going to lay it out on the line every single day, you know, every single night. That's just kind of the heart and soul that she is as a competitor, as a player. And that's what makes her so great. Um, I'm not trying to come at the players of LA because I think what's happening here is just a far greater scale. I mean, you're looking at a team that very, looked completely out of touch with each other, completely out of tune with each other, maybe some locker room drama. I mean, they just looked like they just – they were done. They didn't want to, it wasn't that they didn't want to be there, but they wanted it to come easy. You know, they, they wanted the shots to fall. They wanted the rhythm. And that's just not how it's going to go. In the case of a five game series, you're going to face adversity. You're going to have to fight back from, you know, being down. I mean, you're playing the Connecticut sun who are clicking on all cylinders. The chemistry is tremendous. This team knows each other inside and out. They're coached extremely well. Their coach knows how to pull the best out of them every single night. So two, these, these franchises are at two opposite points in where they're at right now. And that's just the reality of, of where we're at with the LA Sparks and the Connecticut Sun. And that's why I think it's very difficult for the LA Sparks faithful to see this is this is a reality check of how far this franchise has to go. It doesn't matter if you have players who've done it before. You've got a new coach, you've got a new system, which, you know, people have spoken on the offense of Derek Fisher all year long. I mean, it was, it was, a, it was two, two contrasting styles of play. Connecticut was sharing the basketball. You know, their assist numbers were tremendous. They're cutting, they're active, they're dominating on the glass. LA, it was a ton of iso ball. Um, that's not going to work in a five-game series. That's not going to work against one of the top defenses in the league. You're going to have to outcoach that. You're going to have to outsmart that. Um, and I just felt like there was maybe some chemistry issues. It just did not... Like, like the wires were not connected in any, any capacity with LA and unless things were just shots were falling and things were easy, um, they, they were going to fall apart. And man, they did in the worst way imaginable, but I'm just still very much surprised with, you know, the decision to sit Parker and to prove your point, make it about you the way you wanted to make it. Um, that, that LA front office or that, you know, Derek, Derek Fisher, whoever was making that decision, you can't just put that on Parker because I feel like Chelsea Gray and Raquana Williams struggled as well. So why were those points not made there? And I just don't think it's the appropriate time to prove a point. Um, I think you got to look inward and understand what's going on with this team and why am I not living and dying with the players who, um, have, have been in this moment before Candace Parker is more experienced in this moment than Derek Fisher will be for many years to come. 
That's what I don't understand. Yeah, and I mean, look, that that's a, a problem all on its own, and, and we are going to move on to uh, DC versus Las Vegas now. But my one last point is, I'm not I'm not calling for Derek Fisher to get fired. I'm not saying he's going to get fired. What I am saying, and I'm going to put it out there, is, hey, this is the LA Sparks. Uh, mediocrity is not accepted. This is the LA Sparks getting an embarrassing sweep, uh, getting the third seed and all that jazz. I mean, you've kind of, to a certain extent, entered the Connecticut Sun uh, realm of embarrassing playoff losses when the regular season sets you up for much higher expectations. So, again, not saying... Yeah. That's a tremendous point. That's a tremendous point. You know, we're not looking at the LA Sparks the same way we look at the Atlanta Dream or the same way we look at the Chicago Sky. In my opinion, this is one of the top franchises in the league and from the way they operate, from, from the, where they're located, all of those things, this is the pinnacle of WNBA. Um, and, and I, again, I have been very, um, I am driving the train of criticism of Derek Fisher. Um, again, you know, put together some, some wins this year that that's awesome. Woohoo. But like we're the, the, the measuring stick for where the LA sparks need to be and where they have been. And then you have to question, you know, what does this series mean for this team moving forward from a from a chemistry standpoint? It could very easily get worse. So it's going to be a very interesting off season for this franchise. Yeah, it's it's gonna we'll see we'll, we'll see what happens. Let's move on to DC versus Las Vegas. Uh, in an upset, I mean Las Vegas just talking about shellackings. Vegas just shellacked the number one team in the league, ninety two seventy five to get their first game and survive another day. Uh, Christy Tolliver, 14 points. Ariel Powers, 13 points. Other than that, Elena Eldon's the only other person to score in double figures. Latoya Sanders, two for nine. It was not getting it done on the defensive end for the first time all series. Emma Mieseman finally gets shut down, goes 0 for 2 from 3, 3 for 8 total. I mean, six points. Natasha Cloud, uh, like, just looked like Natasha Cloud from the finals last year. Did not look like Natasha Cloud of the se- of the series. And honestly, Ariel Atkins was not the the Atkins. She you know she was not looking like the the eight year vet who's actually a second year player that we've all grown accustomed to her being. Um, Vegas had that intensity on defense, and and the Mystics really just look stagnant on offense. Talk to me about your thoughts on on uh, Washington and Vegas. I think Vegas, you know, they they it was, <laughs> you know, when you're backed into a corner and it's do or die, you know, you 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 better be able to come out and perform, and they did. You know, prop, props to Las Vegas, props to the way they responded, uh, being able to go back home and compete on your home floor um, with with a little bit of you know edge to you um, was exactly what they showed. I I did not foresee this being a sweep in any manner, um, just because Vegas can do what they did on Sunday night. You know, the the issue with Vegas is their consistency, and that's going to remain the case for however, whether they have one more game, two more, whatever it may be. Um, the consistency is with Vegas is, is going to be the story of their season, that they've got all the firepower in the world. When they're defending the way we know as a top as a top three defensive team in the league, um, and, then, and then you combine, you know, their interior play of Asia Wilson, Liz Cambage, which is playing at extremely high level. You know, both of them combined for, I can't even do the math in my head. Over, um, really And then good. Kayla McBride's knocking down shots. And, and at that point, you don't even necessarily need Kelsey Plum to try and take over everything. You know, she only finished two for nine, but, you know, she finishes with nine assists and nine points on the game. And so when you have the interior um, scoring and, and the dominance that we saw from them, they dominated on the glass. I mean, Liz Cambage was Liz Cambage of 2018. Um, but that hasn't been shown all season, partially because she's playing in a completely different system. Um, Asia Wilson was, was fantastic. She was the Asia that we all know she can be. Um, you know, and I, I, that, that, that's what makes it so fun to watch Vegas is they can go out and do what they did last night. The thing is, they're like, like are they going to be able to go do that three games in a row? In my opinion, there's no way. Um, I would be absolutely shocked if this goes to five games at this point. Um, I hope it does, just because I think it would be <laughs> more basketball, and I, I love this matchup, especially as we go a little bit further in that the drama that's um, continuing to build up and brew right. between these two teams is just uh, so the fans are just eating it up. <laughs> Liz is- but I, I, no, I mean, I agree with you, Rachel. I mean, I don't think we've seen three consistent games like that from Vegas, but talk to me about Plum for a little bit, because I know you touched on her, but 
the that whole game, the thing that I kept thinking to myself was like, all right, yeah, like Liz hasn't really been herself. She showed elements. Asia had like has looked off a few of those games. But to me, the crazy thing is like if Kelsey Plum can can instill herself into the game as not a scorer. And that's what I saw where she didn't even attempt a shot until like the second quarter, like the second half or something crazy like that. I mean, she she made up her mind that, hey, I'm going to get all because she knows if they're going to win the championship, it's going to be an, a, a Minnesota Lynx style where they spread the love. Kayla McBride needs to be, you know, their version of Maya Moore. Liz Cambage needs to be their uh, Sylvia Fowles, as it were. Asia Wilson slash Derrica Hamby needs to be the Rebecca Brunson and all that jazz. And Kelsey Plum knows she needs to be more of a Lindsey Whalen, for instance, than a, 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 a Simone Augustus who's going to score a bunch. She needs to be someone who is going to lift her teammates up if they want to win a championship. And honestly, in my mind, game ball goes to Kelsey Plum. Yeah, she only scores nine points. She goes two for nine, one from three from three, four for four from the free throw line. But seven rebounds, nine assists, and only three turnovers. That's the key to me. Kelsey Plum is is an elite level point guard, and her being able to be in her natural element, which is at that point guard spot, and, and, and just kind of the process she's been through these past few years within the league and the player she's evolved into in her professional manner is really what we're seeing. And you're exactly right. I mean, she's the leader of this team. She, have, having the ball in her hands and having that confidence um, from her coach we're, we're starting to see those things come into play. And in Las Vegas, their only opportunity to go win a championship is starting with their interior play. That's, that's been the, that's been the, the, the key, the goal. Um, when this team is at their best, Cambage, Hamby, Wilson are our dominant. But you have to be able to have a threat outside in McBride. McBride has to make shots. Kelsey Plum has to be a serious threat. She is. She has been a serious threat for the, for the you know th- this entire series. We've seen her ability to score the ball. First game finishes with 16, follows it up with a 19 point performance. Um, but that doesn't necessarily have to be her role. Is this mass score? And I think if she's got the weight of the world on her shoulders to go score, that's not going to be the, the best looking Vegas team we're going to have. You've got to have that interior scoring, and um, they did a tremendous job of getting the ball where it needed to go last night. Um, and making those decisions, and she did a really good job of taking care of it. Turnovers have been a really ugly thing for this Aces team in this series. Um, and, and, you know, what, what the way they played last night is how this team is designed to be, is what this team is built to be. Um, it's can they show up and do that night after night against the best team in the league um, is, is the biggest issue. And being able, you know, if they are able to pull out a win on Tuesday night, then can you take this party on the road and go do it out in DC? That, that will be quite the question if we do get to that point. But um, again, it, 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 it's still just such a new franchise and, and these, these, these players have not been through this battle um, the way we've seen the Connecticut Sun go through this battle or that even the Washington Mystics go through a playoff type of battle. Um, are they poised to go on and win this entire thing? My answer is no. Yeah, I mean, I'll be real. Like, let's, 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 talk, let's call a spade, let's call an ace an ace. Uh, if, <laughs> if the aces are able to put this to game five and, and pull off a win against the Mystics, if, if the aces can flip this around, that's demoralizing, that's embarrassing, and that might be the end of the Mystics championship run or championship aspirations for a long time because I'm gonna be real. The the cards I'm I'm trying to, I'm trying too hard to make puns right now, so I'm gonna give it up. Yeah. Let's be real. Like if if you're if you're in uh, the Mystics team, you know, this team that knocked that was on the doorstep last year, the publisher clearinghouse doorstep, and they didn't get the check. And now you're coming back to it and everything. I mean, not like I'm not trying to take away from what the Mystics did, but let's be real. This whole season has given them the platter for that championship. All the injuries, all the players who aren't playing, you know, all of the weird happenings and, and, and the ridiculously high highs of their offense. I do not remember a game this season where the Washington Mystics had two quarters where they scored less than 15 points in those quarters. That is mind-blowing. That is insane. Let me give you a few percentages right now. 38.6 and 33 and 83. That's their field goal, their three-point, and their free throw percentage. Now, some might look at me and say, ah, that's not a horrible three-point percentage. For this team, it kind of is. I mean, I'm looking at all those numbers, 
And they're much lower than I expect from this team. They, they were not shooting well. They were missing open shots consistently. They were, but like, I, I feel like if you're a Mystics fan, if you're this Mystics team, like there's no reason to panic. Um, you know, I, I don't think now, again, Tuesday is going to be the, the, the tall tale sign kind of, kind of what, obviously, I mean, I'm speaking, obviously if Mystics win, they're going on to the finals, but if they come out Tuesday and struggle again, then at that, like, like in my mind, they have to go take this Tuesday. I, I really feel like if this gets pushed to five, the momentum that Vegas has, even though they're going on the road back to DC is, is, is alarming. And even though they are a little bit inconsistent, you have to start to wonder, man, Washington has been playing so well for so long. Are they hitting a Valley right now at the, at the wrong time? Um, but I'm, I don't think there's any reason to panic. Um, I think you, again, you have to credit this ACES team. They, they have the talent. This is a talent. This there's, they have enough talent to go win this entire thing. They just don't have the experience to go win this entire thing. Um, which goes against everything that I even said at the beginning of the season where I, I picked them to be the favorites to win it. Um, I was probably very premature in that. I would, would, would I will 100% admit it. Oh, I mean, hey, Rachel, I, I picked uh, the Mercury, so. But, 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 I, but, I, but I'm, I, I agree with you. If it does end up, in my mind, a, the, the slight chance that Vegas pulls this thing off, it will be absolutely devastating for the Washington Mystics um, to, 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 to lose, <laughs> to lose in a five game series after you won the first two and to, and to not make the finals. I mean, I can't even imagine the conversations that will take place and just the absolute shock um, throughout the WBA community if they just get beaten in the series. But I think we're probably a little premature to be talking about that right now. Um, it I mean, I, I, Rachel, I just, I need to throw out the mindset <laughs> of like how this would happen because let, let's lay out what you know the chess pieces for everyone. Yeah, Coach T never won a championship in his whole career. Trying to finally check that off the bucket list, as they say. You have Coach T's son, Lil T, who is right there waiting to become the new head coach. Uh, you, like to me, that there's an unspoken, or maybe it's a spoken uh, behind closed doors agreement. Um, that I have no inside knowledge to any of this. This is just my speculation that either after this season or next season, Coach T is stepping down and handing that to a, to his son. Now, whether or not he stays as GM, if the Mystics want to continue to succeed, I think he better stay as GM. But just imagine how that talk goes, you know, because to a certain extent, like if he wins and, and you know, they they – walk off to the sunset he can be like all right i'm gonna stick around it's still the same team handing it off to my son you lose this you lose this series going up 2-0 then then getting knocked around by lv that's when you start to go oh you know that kind of throws a wrench in that wheel and you start to question that and it possibly a wheel falls off and the whole thing burns because let's be real what after you win a championship or after you get to that height one of the hardest things and correct me if I'm wrong, is that consistency to keep that level of play up and to keep a roster that can continue that success. Now, in the W, it's a little bit easier. If you have, you know, especially for a D.C. team that has a lot of people who are from the area, from the East Coast area around it, so it makes your life a little bit easier. But let's be realistic about it. It could very quickly, uh, you know, Everything just starts falling apart. You know, maybe this player goes, maybe this player decides, eh, maybe I'll try a bigger role here. And then it's all gone. So, the, like, if the DC is going to win a championship, it's going to be this year. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. We said that weeks ago. We absolutely did. Um, and, and I think, you know, you're, you're in a moment in time where they're playing well, they're playing with confidence. Elena Deladon is healthy. Natasha Cloud has been playing well. I mean, she didn't play greatest last night. Um, but yeah, I agree with you. With where this team at is, I mean, they're they're primed. They should win it this year. They absolutely should win it this year. And if they don't, anything other than a championship will be a disappointment. Yeah, I agree. Well, uh, let's uh, let's talk real quickly. Key players looking forward for this last game. You're talking about DC. Who's your key player? Who you who you locking in on? I think I think uh, Natasha Cloud. You know, she's such a she's such a key factor in this team. She missed some missed some shots, and and not not saying she was atrocious by any stretch, but she's got to be a plus Natasha Cloud for this team to go. Uh, how about you? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you on that. I mean, for me, uh, and and I'll, I and I said this on our live stream. If you haven't checked it out, you should check out our live stream. Uh, Gabe and I did a live stream following these games last night, and for me, it's. 
I, I always go back to when I was talking to Brian Agler last year when he was coach of the Sparks and talking about how he decides who to put Elena Beard on because, you know, you don't want to put her on the point guard who's running around all crazy and then exhaust her. You want to find and pinpoint that player on the team that if you can disrupt her, that kind of disrupts the whole flow of the offense. And Natasha Cloud is that player. And that's kind of the blueprint to beating this team is get her off her game because I'm going to be real. Chrissy Tolliver is a great player, a lights out shooter, a ridiculously talented player, but she doesn't orchestrate that offense. She doesn't make that offense flow. In fact, she slows down that offense a little bit. That, that's not a knock. That's just a reality of her style of play. She slows down the flow of that offense a little bit. If, if Natasha Cloud isn't out there and isn't, you know, orchestrating that offense, make the ball move around the extra pass, that's what's going to cost them a game, and that can easily cost them a series. Let's flip it on the other side to Vegas. Uh, I'm going with Kelsey Plum, but with Kayla McBride as a close second. Similar reason. Kelsey Plum needs to orchestrate this offense. Kelsey Plum needs to, you know, be that person who's uh, who's saying, who's holding other teammates accountable, who's making sure that other teammates feel the height of their success and feel the realities of, you know, when they're not putting their 100% in. This Vegas one's a really tough one for me because I feel like you could you could easily pin it on, you know, their guard play. Carol, Kayla McBride, Kelsey Plum, one of them, you know, Kayla McBride being able, she has to put up numbers. Um, but th- there, there's something in me that really – is looking at Asia Wilson. You know, when Asia is going, and she is the Asia Wilson, almost MVP type of Asia Wilson that we have loved to watch these last few years, uh, when she's doing what she did last night, um, it really pulls the rest of this team to go with her, I feel like. Um, So as much as I think you could go down the line and really point at any single one of these starters, um, even even Dierka Hamby, because in my mind, she's just up there with the starters. I feel like in this series, it's Asia Wilson. Yeah, I'll go with that. Hey, I've, I've and then I've noticed like the some of the games she looks like she's never been in a playoff series before. But then once you get her that early confidence, once you get her that support, you know that's that's when uh, minds change. And let's be real, playoffs are so mental, so mental. Well, and this Aces team is. Um, they're they're at their best when they're a very emotional team. You know, when they're getting hype and they're they're chest bumping and and people are getting pissed off and they're they're like a bunch of you know like rough riders out there. Like that that's when this team is at their best. When when Asia Wilson's bringing that emotional energy that she brings to the table, it gets everybody else going. And I think that's kind of what I'm meaning when I'm saying she plays on that level of dominance. And we have multiple players on this team who are dominant. I'm just talking about Asia Wilson's energy, her aura, what she brings to this table to bring those other players with her is what they're going to need to push this to five. Yeah, hey, I agree. And as we always say, we believe the players of the W and its community deserve the same in-depth analysis and respect that men's sports receive on a daily basis. Please consider joining our Patreon community to help support us in the hard work that we do.